while the street high for the S&P 500 is now at 55.53, our next guest says, hold my beer. He is looking at an even higher uh, target for the S&P 500 this year, 57.50. Joining us now is Infrastructure Capital Advisor CEO Jay Hatfield. And indeed, in a recent note, you talked about 57.50. AI is part of it. And the Fed outlook is part of it. So, so talk, us, talk to us about how you got there. Thanks, Julie. Well, it, it does relate to the conversation we're just having. We're assuming the 10-year goes to three and a quarter. Ah. <laughs> so if it doesn't, then the theoretical value of the S&P is way below our target. Mm -hmm. So we can't accept, it's not going to work if Jamie Dimon's right and we have 8% treasuries. But we are bullish, notwithstanding the fact that our economy is strong, because Europe is very weak. And U.S. investors have a very strong tendency to ignore the rest of the world which makes all the sense in the world with equities, because you have NVIDIA, all the, the best companies are here, and everybody looks to the US for equities. But with bonds, that, they're very fungible. So if the ECB cuts, um, I think the UK will cut. We always already had the Swiss bank cut. Global rates should rally, and that will spark the next leg of the rally. Have you, Jay, been surprised at the way with which equity investors specifically have kind of made their peace with the notion that rates are going to be higher for longer? I mean, if we went back in time six months, um, well, we saw the market you know, have a rough patch in the fall of last year. And you know, fast forward to now, maybe it's June, but everyone's like, ah, it's fine. We're going we're gonna to be handling this just fine. Have you been surprised by that resilience, maybe? Really, I would, yeah, what we would call this uh, when I worked at Big Hedge Funds is a bad short. Like this market should be getting smashed, right? We went from yeah. 380 at the beginning of the year to 435, and we're just turning around at all-time highs. So what I think is happening is exactly like last year, why we were bullish last year. Yeah. Everybody knows the next inflection is a cut. Last year was a pause. So why do you want to sell now just because it's going to take two more months to have the cut? Well, and to that point, do you feel there's a positioning part of this market too? Are people still caught like flat-footed, to your point, on the wrong side of this? Because that's, you know, that's really what happened in 22. What happened in 23 is 24 just an extension of that kind of <laughs> idea in the market. Absolutely. And not just hedge funds, but also just individuals are very attracted to having 5% money that's low risk. Like, I advise one of my friends on his portfolio, he called me up and said, oh, I want to raise another 10% cash because I can get five in the market. And I said, well, but if small caps are up 25 and the market's up 15, mm -hmm. then you're going to leave 10% on the table. So I do think a lot of people took solace in getting higher rates and are being too conservative because you don't want to miss the first leg of the rally because that's where you get the excess returns. From there on, you get the normal kind of 10%. We should get 15 to 20 probably this year and next year. So, uh, you know, when I look at this and see 5750 and here you say three and a quarter on the tenure, three and a quarter feels like a, a sort of a bigger swing than 5750 to me, just in my gut. Right. How high conviction are you and are you hedging those views? Well, I think that we would get really concerned if the ECB started to say they were going to push mm. off those cuts. We have been short Fed fund futures uh, most of this year which is a mildly profitable trade. You have to do billions to actually make it move. It doesn't move around that much. So um, we had expected that all along, and we would have been reevaluating, re maybe lowering our target if it was dependent on the Fed. But the thing to keep in mind is that the dollar is going to be very strong. If the ECB cuts, UK cuts, Fed holds, the dollar is going to continue to appreciate. That's very deflationary. Oil's priced in dollars. We're bearish about CPI printing a little bit hot because uh, uh, oil prices have run up, gasoline prices have run up. So if we get declining oil prices, lower commodities, stronger dollar, it's very deflationary. So that should give the Fed cover to cut in July, even if our economy continues to be strong. But it sounds like maybe the Fed is comfortable being a little bit of a global outlier in that, you know, again, in a situation where you have the dollar doing some of the work they need done for them on the inflation side, they might be comfortable, you know, not following, you know, Matt Amelgard right away, giving, mm -hmm. giving them a little bit of a lead time. Would that be a change maybe from the way the Fed has thought of their role as a global central bank? Uh, no doubt. And also it's extremely unusual for other central banks to go before the Fed because it massively weakens their currency. So it's not the normal situation, but this US economy is just a juggernaut. You know, the combination of AI, we have a housing shortage, none of this exists in Europe. Europe has floating rate mortgages, by the way. 
So it's terrible for consumers. We have almost none because of the financial crisis. So the U.S. advantages, natural gas prices are 80% below the rest of the world, are so profound, this is a very unusual cycle. Like, we should have a recession right now.